Welcome to the European DDI user conference. Um, this is session one about questionnaires and I will be your chair. I will uh, introduce uh, speakers and uh, manage questions and answers. And I'm happy that we have so many people here uh, watching us now having this first virtual version of the EDI conference. And um, I think uh, we will start with Haley Mills. Um, she's a metadata manager at Closer, which is a consortium of the UK longitudinal studies based at University College London. She will be presenting strategies for recreating questionnaires in TDI lifecycle, and her co-author is Jenny Lee. So um, please, Hayley, it's your time now. Thanks, Wolfgang. Hopefully everyone can see my screen okay and can hear me. Yes, looks good. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so in this presentation, I'll start with an introduction to what CLOSER is, what CLOSER discovery is, followed by why we're documenting questionnaires. Then I'll describe a new approach we're taking to document legacy questionnaires. And then I'll finish with some case study examples. So CLOSER is a consortium of UK longitudinal studies, which aims to maximize the use, value and impact of those studies. These are our partners and our partner studies. As you can see, they span a wide time frame. They are from across the whole of the UK, both national and regional studies. And we have a mix of both biomedical and social science based studies. Um, there are now a total of 19 studies as part of the CLOSER consortium. And out of those 19 studies, we have 14 in the process of being added to CLOSER discovery. So CLOSER has a lot of different areas of work, but our flagship product is CLOSER discovery, and this is our metadata portal. So this is where we include metadata from the studies including about the study itself, the sweeps, the data sets and variables, questionnaires and questions, etc. It is based on DDI lifecycle and the Collectica software stack. So I won't be demonstrating discovery here, but if you are interested, you can have a look at the website and have a go. Um, and there's also a video demo on the site as well. So why document questionnaires? So basically it increases transparency and reproducibility by providing provenance information like questions and response domains, which are linked to variables. So whereas data variables have limited capability to hold this information, and using PDFs of questionnaires is pretty um, cumbersome. It also provides extra context for the data, including the order of the questions, response options, instructions, and it can also help with determining the population of the data when you have the routing. It provides greater searchability. And in addition, you can reuse the documented questions to create a question bank, for example. Lastly, it helps to organize and manage the data using concepts and responses. So for example, linking the variables longitudinally, it helps having the context of what the question was and also the concepts that they're linked to. So we've documented over 300 questionnaires so far across 10 studies, and these are all included in um, closer discovery. And most of these have been entered manually, as you can see from all the paper in our office. Um, and this was done using Archivist. And Archivist is our in-house questionnaire editor. Um, but with more studies being added to closer and closer discovery, and with lots of computer aided questionnaires or interviews still left to enter, which are hundreds of pages long, 
we wanted to try and reduce the manual entry work as much as possible. So that was our aim. So we can think of the approaches to documenting legacy metadata as being on a continuum from manual typing on one end to the complete automatic entry on the other end. And we are trying to move towards the more automation end and away from the manual. So as I said, our aim is to reduce the manual work. And while doing this, we wanted to make sure that the entry still remained with the person who would normally enter the questionnaire manually. So for example, a metadata assistant. We also wanted to continue to have a process which didn't involve too much knowledge of DDI like we do with the manual entry. And lastly, we still wanted to maintain um, high quality metadata. So we decided to use spreadsheets as the approach to do this. So the structure of these reflects the DDI relationships but it's presented in a more comprehensive way. So it utilizes the skills which many people in the studies already have. And so you don't need to rely on having technical um, DDI knowledge or XML or programming staff, which can be hard to recruit for. So this is a basic example of the table structure um, the first table at the top is for question items. This has a response which can relate to either the response table or the code list table. And in this case, it is a code list. Then if you wanted to add positions to create a questionnaire flow, then you can add the parent and position. And in this case, the parent is a sequence. So it relates to the sequence table. But you can also have parents which are conditions or loops and we have separate tables for those as well. So as we wanted the, the person who would normally be doing the manual entry to also be able to do this automated process, we set up a GitLab pipeline which Jenny in our team developed. So GitLab is similar to GitHub in that, in that you can upload your code and version controller, et cetera. But with GitLab, you can run the code online. Some of you are probably familiar with this already, but it basically simplifies the process of the person running the code as you don't have all the complicated software set up making sure you have the correct versions, have the modules installed and the environment set up as it's all handled online. So what you do is you import the spreadsheets as an input, as we just saw, and then it outputs DDI lifecycle XML and it goes through the archivist database in between to do this. So it has the advantage of the person who does the uploading um, to be able to, in the output, check it in Archivist to see if they're happy. And if not, they can edit the spreadsheets and re-upload them and check again. So it can be an iterative process and doing this saves time later on with um, making manual edits. It also has the advantages that you can add checks or tests for the spreadsheets before the metadata is added. So for example, checking for duplicate labels. Okay, so now we'll go through some examples of what formats were used as inputs for this approach. So I'm starting with the use case from Rural Child Health and Development Study. They have questionnaires in PDF format and they also have questionnaire metadata held in a bespoke access database. They have a relatively small team with a retired programmer who works like when they need him. So initially, the only format which we could import into Archivist 
was DDI XML. And so their programmer did a great job in able, and was able to write a script which converted their access table information directly into DDI. However, this was a really complicated process involving lots of programming time and was quite fragile. So any bugs would be difficult to resolve and they always had to rely on their programmer as every time they wanted to enter a questionnaire, the programmer would have to be the one to run the script and then fix any of the issues related to that particular questionnaire. So we tried this alternative approach where a script was written to pass the metadata from the access tables into spreadsheet tables instead. And then these could be imported through the pipeline. This was much simpler to do and was much more robust process, which meant that it didn't need the continued input from their retired um, programmer. The second use case is from the Whitehall 2 study. So they had unstructured scanned copies of paper questionnaires and they had a data dictionary, which was in Excel. So the data dictionary was mainly for variables, but it did contain code lists, which once reformatted could be imported into ArcVist and saving time in, as you didn't need to enter all this information again. And so this example shows that you can use a mixed approach of importing some metadata and entering the rest manually. And it also shows how you can reuse what metadata you already have. The last use case is using input from semi-structured PDFs from computer-aided interviews. So these KIs are much longer than paper questionnaires. And when these are entered manually, they can take several months to enter. The design of the KIs often have some kind of formatting, which gives them structure. So for example, here, the question name has a question mark in front of it. And this formatting can be utilized to make entering the questionnaire metadata more systematic. So NIMAL in our team developed the process of copying and pasting the questionnaire into Excel and then using formulas to extract part of the questionnaire based on that format. So this method is useful when you have KIs which only have a PDF. So they don't have any code or any other stru structured metadata that go along with it. And we've been utilizing this process for some of the national birth cohorts, including the National Child Development Study. And recently, we've used this method to enter questionnaires um, that were went into the field to measure COVID-19. Um, and even though these were online questionnaires in 2020, we still don't have any structured metadata for them. So they're basically like legacy questionnaires again. Um, partly, I think, was because of the quick turnaround around to get them out. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Just using a small remark, Hayley, uh, yes. you have uh, t uh, two or three minutes left. OK, thanks. Okay. So using this process sped things up for us and meant we were able to add these questionnaires to discovery. Uh, much more quickly, and many of these COVID questionnaires are now um, on discovery. So I'm just going to finish with some advantages and disadvantages of this approach. Um, so the main advantage is that it's obviously faster to enter meta the metadata in a less manual way. It also saves some of the laborious work of entering like a 300 page questionnaire manually. You are able to reuse existing metadata that you already have, and you need less technical skills and knowledge of DDI as it utilizes the skills that you most likely already have in the team, like spreadsheets and databases. However, 
there are some disadvantages, particularly if you are reusing existing metadata, um, as that relies on that being to a good standard, which isn't always the case. So for example, in the Whitehall 2 that we saw with the code list earlier, you may have noticed that there was a, a typo in the spreadsheet. So it might be that the quality of your metadata that's already documented is not up to the standard that you require. And so you could spend more time fixing and editing those than it would take to enter from scratch. And secondly, the whole process can't be completely automated as there'll always be some manual work to some degree. So some of the things don't lend themselves well or work well in this process, like um, grids or boxes, like um, that kind of thing. Um, so everything usually needs some tidying up or some tweaking, depending on the um, quality. Um, and all, the other thing that needs to be done manually is verification. So this is basically what, checking it or doing some QA once it's entered. So for every questionnaire that has been entered, we have it verified by another member of the team to ensure the quality. So even if the entering process is sped up, the amount of time it takes to verify still remains the same. So that needs to be factored in. Okay, so just to conclude, to summarize, um, having questionnaires documented increases the transparency, reproducibility and discoverability and can result in other advantages, including the creation of a question bank, for example, or helping to create concordance between longitudinal variables. The approach of documenting legacy questionnaires is on a continuum. It's not one or the other. You don't have to choose between completely manual or completely automated. You can use a semi-automated approach to speed things up. Automatic extraction of DDI lifecycle requires a high skill level, but using spreadsheets makes it much simpler process for everyone. And as you've seen, we've had lots of studies with lots of different formats and levels of metadata. So lastly, this approach can be adapted and is flexible to the inputs you have. And most of the time it is worthwhile doing some automation, even if it can't all be done that way. So um, just to finish, here's some links to Discovery, the GitLab pipeline, Archivist GitHub, and how to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Hayley. This uh, is a really nice presentation. Um, and we could now take some questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, Thanks. Uh, I have seen, uh, there's a question from Hilde um, about the archivist. Would archivist be available for others to use? Yeah, so archivist is open source um, and it is on our, um, GitHub page. Um, the main thing you'd need to set up yourself is um, like a, a server basically for it to run on. So um, we don't actually run it as a service um, yet, but if you're interested in the code and setting it up yourself, it is on GitHub. And does that include the, the routines to, to export the DDI? Uh... Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can um, export one. So Archivist is mainly for the manual entry or for tidying up past in um, metadata yeah. and it exports DDI lifecycle XML in as an instance. Um, and the GitLab pipeline is available. Again, it's open source. Um, and we do have um, people outside of of our internal team using it. So other studies in the consortium are able to use it. Um, yeah, but again, you, you, okay. you'd have to have your own setup. Very good. And I just would like to say, Hilda also says, great presentation, Haley. So oh, thanks. <laughs> not to skip that. Thanks, Hilda. Um, then there's another question. Uh, is this software developed forward or finished? I think it refers to archivists as well. 
Yeah, um, so it is a finished working product, yeah. So we've been using it for maybe the past four years. Um, with oh, It's always been improved. Um, yeah, so we've recently made some updates okay. to it. And yeah, but it's yeah. working now. Yeah. Uh, I myself have another question about these uh, manual uh, verification that you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's that's clear that the contents need to be uh, checked so that there was no loss or no no, no um, errors during the transformation process. Is this also needed for the DDI lifecycle format itself, or is this uh, always ensuring that there's a valid DDI um, output? available because DDI in itself is, is um, needs a lot of um, formal um, validation. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. So it, sh it should normally export um, valid DDI, um, but we can check, we check that usually before we enter it. Yeah. Into, or upload it into closer discovery because the collect because software can can check that as well to make sure yeah. it's valid yeah. but if we have any issues i mean they don't happen very often but if there are any issues with the xml that comes out then we can we run it through the validator to check it's not yeah and then um, you can XML. go back and and fix yeah what, exactly what causes the error okay thank you um Thanks a lot. are there any any other questions from the audience Not at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hayley and Jenny. Um, and then we can go to our next presentation. Uh, it will be Lucy Marie presenting. She is a metadata manager at the French Center of Sociopolitical Data for Sciences Po, Paris. She has a demographic background background and she joined the data sharing team led by Alina Dancio in January of this year. She is currently mainly involved in a pilot project which aims to create a question bank in DDI lifecycle with Collectica. So Lucy, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you Wolfgang. Uh, can you hear me well and can you see yes. me? Yes. Okay, so thanks everybody for being here today. Uh, I'm going to present my experience of using Collectica to document a socio-political survey in the DDI lifecycle standard. So firstly, uh, I'm going to give you the context in which uh, the pilot project of the question bank uh, in DDI-L uh, takes place. Secondly, I will describe the <clears throat> experimentation phase as well as the implementation of the documentation process uh, at the variable level. Thirdly, I will show you the, uh, some results on the Collectica portal. And after that, I will come back to the challenges and the benefits of uh, such project. And finally, I will conclude on the next steps uh, of the ongoing uh, activity. So uh, just a remark, can you maybe um... Uh, switch the the view of the of the speakers so because this is an overlay on your slides we cannot see your slides completely okay but uh, you cannot see uh, my screen uh, because maybe it's uh, the okay no it's my problem sorry sorry okay. i interrupted <laughs> you for nothing so <laughs> go ahead please <laughs> So the Center for Sociopolitical Data collects and shares um, social sciences and humanities data and metadata, mostly uh, political science for research uh, community. We provide information to users through various online tools. Um, so the data set are available on the Ketley Projedo platform. Projedo is a French uh, CESDA provider and the CDSP uh, is a member of Projedo. So about meta metadata, we used to share it on Nestar, but we are currently testing the Collectica applications for variable, for variable documentation 
and we shift to a Dataverse portal for study level. So a little aside, if you are interested in Dataverse solution, check out the presentation of Alina Dansur in the data harmonization uh, this session this afternoon, and the one of uh, Geneviève Michaud and uh, Baptiste Roxel tomorrow uh, in the managing uh, session. So <clears throat> we also have a, a question bank, the Catholic uh, Projet d'eau question bank, developed uh, 10 years ago. And one of the goal of the UpMed project is to upgrade the, this question bank uh, to the DDI lifecycle format. So the UpMed project uh, was founded by the Research National Agency. The acronym uh, means Upscaling Metadata for Increasing Reuse in the Social Sciences. Uh, UpMed is in line with the open science movement. It aims to make uh, data more findable accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable by upgrading data uh, stewardship and preservation. More specifically, the work package two focuses on the creation of a question bank with Collectica tools that respect uh, the DDI lifecycle standard. So the main objective is to harmonize uh, metadata in order to improve uh, accessibility and such uh, flexibility for users. Uh, to access uh, semantic interoper interoperability with the SESDA European Question Bank, as well as to access documentation unicity by removing uh, metadata duplication and improving discoverability um, as metadata is easier, easier to found. So the project uh, starts uh, at the beginning of this year. Initially, um, Alexandre Mero might work on the project, but uh, he left the team for new job opportunities uh, in March. So the next part uh, of, the pre of this presentation uh, reflects uh, my own experience for the past year. I hope that will encourage uh, those who start with DDI. Indeed, in one year, I went from junior level without former DDI skills to a standalone uh, metadata, metadata manager. During the first months, I, I had um, to understand what is DDI, as well as the difference between codebook and lifecycle. So the most important principles uh, of the standard are unicity and reusability of uh, items and connection between metadata elements. So then I started to train on metadata harmonization with the um, <clears throat> 2007, 2012, and 2017 waves of the French electoral study. French electoral study uh, surveys uh, are part uh, of the comparative survey electoral system, which is a, an international uh, program. So codebook uh, documentation already existed for the three waves. Uh, and it was a good training, but also challenges, uh, challenging. Indeed, the three waves uh, gather more than 1,000 variables, and the survey were documented by different people uh, in different languages that leads to disharmonize metadata documentation. I also integrate the four waves of the French uh, political barometers uh, in, uh, produced by the CVPOF. Uh, a French um, Center of Political Science uh, of Sciences Po Paris. So in the meantime, uh, I've self-trained on Collectica Designer, which was a new software to me. Moreover, I had to understand the ecosystem with repository and portal. Uh, I also had help from colleagues uh, from Norway. Thank you, uh, ben Benjamin from the NSD, and also from France, uh, Thank you, Alima, uh, from the CI, uh, CISD. So the final goals uh, of the testing phase were, uh, were to construct um, a metadata schema at variable level based on the DDI lifecycle specifications and to set up a variable uh, documentation workflow that uh, I will describe uh, now. So I identify four main, four main stages on my documentation workflow. 
The first one is to gather and analyze existing materials and documentation. The second one is to extract from codebook unique and reusable uh, items. The third one is to edit metadata in designer to match um, with our metadata schema and uh, the DDIL standard. And uh, the final stage is to store and publish metadata uh, on the portal and within the repository. So first, metadata inventory consists um, to identify and document uh, reusable items, lineage, and gaps across survey. These steps uh, may be time consuming depending on the survey content, as well as the quality of the existing documentation. Then the curation phase aim, aims to create a metadata uh, bases in Excel format of unique and reusable uh, items from the DDI, DDI codebook uh, XML files. So after having picked, up, picked out um, what can be reused, uh, I recycle uh, from, from a documentation elements and create new item in designer to match with the metadata schema. So on the one hand, I import uh, firstly the study documentation in XML uh, DDI 2.5 format. Secondly, uh, SPSS data set in which variable objects uh, alre already uh, exist. And thirdly, metadata bases of unique questions and category. On the other hand, I create uh, elements that are specific to DDI uh, lifecycle standard, like series, instruments, represented and conceptual variable and also uh, created code lists to reuse uh, categories. So then I manage uh, metadata in designer between two parts. On the one hand, uh, a resource metadata package where imported and created uh, reusable uh, items are stored. And on the other hand, I create series in which I start by constructing uh, instruments with uh, reusable questions uh, of the um, resource metadata package. Then I import uh, the XML study level documentation, as well as the SPSS data set uh, with variables. After that, I attached uh, a code list from um, <coughs> the resource metadata package uh, to the data set variable and connect uh, it to the source question uh, of the instrument. Finally, um, to create a lineage, I link the dataset variable to a represented variable, which, which is itself uh, associated to a conceptual variable and a category set. And then I do the same process uh, to document uh, the French electoral study uh, 2012 by reusing the same items and connecting uh, variable uh, with concordant uh, elements. So once I document uh, all the variables in designer, I publish them on the portal. And this action uh, automatically stores metadata in DDIL format within the repository. So now I will show the variable metadata results on the Collectica portal interface. So first, the variable description and representation sections uh, gather basic information about one data set variables. As you can see uh, on the screenshot, uh, there is like um, the variable name, variable label, code list values, category label, as well as marginal distribution, and other information about representation. Then uh, the question source section allows you to find original question asked uh, to respondent and um, <clears throat> it's placed within the survey uh, instrument. You can also see the full questionnaire uh, by clicking on this link and uh, you have uh, yeah, the, the full instrument. Uh, now, the represented variable section describes uh, how the variable is measured. 
For example, the variable about the religion of the respondent are exactly the same across both surveys. They have the same, the same questions, the same code list, and the same category uh, representation. So the data set variable of both surveys are connected to the same represented variable, which is itself connecting to the religion conceptual variable. So when two connected uh, variables do not have the same uh, representation, you can link them at uh, the conceptual variable level. The variables appear in different tabs. tabs. Um, as you can see, the partisan proximity variable of French electoral study uh, um, <clears throat> has uh, 11 um, categories uh, for the 2012 years, uh, waves, sorry. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, in the um, uh, 2007 uh, waves, uh, there is only uh, nine categories. So now let's talk about uh, the feedback and benefits. So the first challenge is to understand the shift from a more human logic documentation with the codebook standard to a more ma machine-oriented logic, logic with a life cycle. In addition, I had to find uh, my own workflow among the multiple ways to document in Collectica in order to match with our metadata schema. And moreover, one of the main challenges was to harmonize uh, exact, uh, existing uh, metadata. Uh, as I have mentioned previously, sometimes surveys um, are coded and documented by different people across waves. As you can see uh, on the Nestar screenshots, the gender categories do not have the same um, code values across waves. Therefore, even uh, it, it is the same uh, category, the system does not uh, recognize gender variables in the concordance uh, section. Moreover, another harmonization challenge is the semantic divergence uh, across uh, variables. For instance, uh, the income variables of the French electoral study um, 2007 is only a household monthly income, whereas uh, in the 2012 survey, the household monthly income question is asked in terms of a net income. So post-harmonization issues may slow down the documentation process, as well as make a task automation more difficult. Um, you have about two minutes well, left. OK. okay. So despite uh, of the challenges uh, and circumstances uh, of this specific year, we keep in mind the benefits of the DDIL uh, standards uh, for making CDSP uh, data and metadata Findable uh, in one space uh, of storage uh, within the rep repository, accessible um, through a user friendly interface, interoperable uh, with XML DDI 3.2 uh, documentation, compliant with the Euro European uh, Question Bank, and a reusable item for new and harmonized surveys documentation. So what's next? Uh, we want to first improve uh, skills on Collectica with trainings, um, then uh, publish survey on public portal, as well as to address our metadata by the CESDA uh, European Question Bank. Uh, and um, next, automize part, part of the process uh, and implement new survey into the CDSP Question Bank. And uh, finally, report and share the migration strategy. So to conclude this part, uh, at this time, uh, uh, at the CDSP, we think that DDIL and Collectica are perfect uh, for longitudinal survey data. But we also consider the possibility of using Collectica and DDIL for other type uh, of data for next year. So 
In conclusion, I would like to say thanks again to Benjamin and Hilde from the Norwegian Center of Research Data, who takes time to answer our questions and support us in this project. Moreover, thanks to Alexandre for sharing some of his knowledge before he left. It was, it was short but uh, intense. And um, so all in all, uh, this year of experimentation allows me to develop metadata management skills by myself, and now I can make it available for people who want to, to use uh, DDI and train on DDI lifecycle. So thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Lucy, for this presentation. Uh, this is really interesting stuff. And uh, we can go for some questions. Um, there's one, okay, from Chiara. Uh, great presentation, thank you. I was just wondering, is your Collectica portal accessible publicly? Um, not yet, but um, in the next month, uh, it's one of, of our goal. But uh, we have we publish only on the portal uh, on the testing portal but uh, in few few weeks it will be okay you will you announce this in, uh, in the community yes, yes of no? course. okay okay great um and there's another question from Hilde. Thank you very much, Lucy Marie. Could you please explain a little more about the semantic operability with the EQB that you mentioned? So we have um, XML, uh, as I said, uh, we have XML 3.2 um, uh, format uh, in DDI lifecycle, and uh, we, we will share our XPath with um, the member uh, of the the, um, <clears throat> the EQB to like to be in line with um, uh, then the harvesting standard of uh, the EQB. Yes, and there's another question, maybe connected. To yes to this from Knud. Do you access the metadata also with your own tools or do you use only Collectica software? Uh, we only use Collectica software, but we uh, also um, create um, a program to extract uh, automatically from uh, XML um, codebooks to, to get uh, for the curation phase. You know, like to get uh, the unique item in a spreadsheet. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any further questions at this, this moment. If we have some time left at the end of this session, we might come back to this, but uh, thank you for now. Thank you. And we can go over to our next presentation. It will be done by Fabienne Perragibert. She's been working for INSEE, the French National Institute of Statistics since 2003. Uh, she worked on survey management, sampling methodology, and mainly on IT project management as a project owner. She did discovered DDI two years ago uh, when she became responsible for their questionnaire design tool called Pokes. And I'm very, and she's very proud of what she can do with it. So we are really uh, looking forward to the presentation of Fabienne. Thank you, Valvedang. So um, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, firstly, I want to apologize because I have got a big uh, conjunctivitis and uh, I am uh, 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 talking with my nose today. <laughs> so uh, sorry. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen. OK. Can you see my presentation? Yes, looks good. OK, thank you. So let's talk about specification and generation of questionnaires, a metadata driven approach powered by DDI. So 
So uh, 10 years ago, two different projects were launched uh, at INSEE. Uh, Coltrane, it is a transversal platform for business surveys, and uh, Hermes, it is our metadata repository. And they raise the question of questionnaire industrialization, how to deal with the development of dozens of web forms, long, long ones, personalized ones, and the description of metadata in DDI appeared as an opportunity to standardize the description of questionnaire metadata and to use it to generate data collection instruments. So new tools for our business survey were then developed and are still in use for almost 13 different surveys uh, here in France, uh, mostly for uh, INSEE surveys. In uh, 2015, uh, ENO, or question on generator um, was able to generate the first uh, web form for uh, a first uh, survey using using it and uh, we have been working on pugs or question design interface uh, since uh, the same time but it is really available for survey designer uh, since 2018 and in the same year we saw uh, the first paper form generated by ENO. Um, at the moment, we've got a project to extend industri industrialization to household surveys. Uh, it is underway and focuses on it, it focuses on interview forms. So question of design, how does it work? PUGS is a user interface to describe the question of metadata in an international standard, DDI lifecycle, as a 3.3 version, and in a very simple way. And um, linked to PUGS, we've got ENO, the questionnaire generator, um, from a DDI description of a formal specification of the metadata of a questionnaire. It is able to um, generate web forms, paper forms, specification document, and soon interviewer form. So here we can see that DDI is at the heart of our process. Um, it is uh, the DDI uh, description of uh, a questionnaire. It is an output from uh, PUGS, or user interface. Um, from uh, this file, ENO is able to generate a face-to-face -face form, web form, paper form, uh, soon, perhaps phone form. We don't know exactly. Uh, now it it will be very different from face-to-face uh, face-to-face -face form or not, and the specification document. So Pugs is a question on design uh, in user interface for metadata-driven collection. It is integrated in the other information systems, so our uh, repository our metadata repository Hermes and our questionnaire generator ENO. It will be linked one day with uh, our uh, metadata repository. We are working uh, on it at the moment and it is producing a single DDI questionnaire from which uh, our generator ENO is able to generate different questionnaire formats. The target population of PUGS uh, is survey designers and the main focus of this tool is to visualize the questionnaire at any moment in one click, thanks to ENO, uh, in very fast iteration. PUGS um, allows survey designer to describe their questionnaire and um, to describe it with sequences or subsequences, statements like help, instruction, and so on, questions included clarification ones, response formats, variable, collected, calculated, or external ones, go-tos, and controls. And I think that uh, nothing is more useful than a little demonstration of uh, our tools. So I go, I'm going to do, to do it. To do it. Um, can you see my Firefox uh, screen? Yes, it's on yes. the screen. Okay, yeah. thank you. So here it's a um, demo version online of bugs. Um, I can create a new questionnaire 
or uh, I can edit an existing one and modify it. So um, let's go to this uh, question or example for this uh, webinar. So here I, I've got uh, only uh, one second called Pugs. And uh, I'm going to add a question with this button. And uh, the f my first question could be, have you ever used Pugs? And uh, the ID could be um, use Pugs. Um, let's say it's a single choice response and you can answer for example with a yes no code list so here i am i've got the code one for yes the code two for no okay i i generate the collected variable link to this question on this response format. Okay, so the, um, the big uh, strength of Pugs is uh, to be linked with Eno and uh, we can visualize our question at any moment just by one click. So here we've got uh, the visualization functionalities. Here I can visualize my web form. Sometimes I, I will try again. It was working just before. <laughs> Unlucky. Okay, it's okay. So here you've got um, a, a generic start. It, it is written uh, in French, so debut is uh, the same as start. Um, so here I can see my first sequence, Pugs, my first question. Have you ever used Pugs and the yes-no possibility? And if I go further, I can see that uh, uh, I'm uh, at the end. Fin is uh, the French name. Uh, I can add some more uh, questions. For example, uh, what do you think of Pugs? So it could be uh, my Pugs feelings question. Here we can imagine a simple a text, a simple response text. Okay. Uh, I can add uh, a control. For example, uh, I want this question to be answered, so I can um, check if it is answered or not. Uh, So I will add a non-response control. And uh, this control uh, will be launched if uh, bugs, feelings is uh, different from, uh, is empty, sorry. And uh, the fail message could be please answer this question. Okay. Uh, I can add another sequence, Eno, for example. And I can add a go-to. We can imagine that if you have never used Pugs, you don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> so um, if you answer no please go to no sequence so the condition will be uh, that uh, user pugs use pugs is equal to no then the target will be no the sequence no so let's uh, have a look at our web form. Okay. 
Okay, so the same uh, start, um, generic start. Here we can see uh, my two questions. And if I don't answer to the second one, when I try to go further, I will have an, uh, an advertisement. And uh, here I can see my file message with too high for this, sorry. Please answer this question. Okay, and if I uh, tick no here, I, I can see that uh, I don't have the second question. Uh, I will go directly to the Heno sequence. So let's uh, return to our presentation. Can you see my presentation? I think it's okay. I think I have an, um, shared my entire screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So Maybe you can just quickly answer a question. Will this POKES demo be available later too? I think as a as an online version is the question, because the recording will be available. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. And we've got um, it uh, in French also. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, a video online uh, for French people. <laughs> Okay. And uh, yes, yes, uh, we can imagine uh, over um, demo version in English mm. or okay. even per perhaps in, in Deutsch, <laughs> <laughs> in German, good. sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so you next... have about three minutes left. So. Okay, so next yeah. step for Pugs and Eno, uh, we are now working um, uh, on new steps. Um, we want to improve existing functionalities add a parser for formula in control or go to, we don't have at the moment, work on accessibility and responsive design. Um, we want to publish a questionnaire um, specified, uh, described in PUGS in our metadata repository in order to re retrieve in this repository questionnaires, sequences, questions, card lists, and uh, the goal is to reuse them um, um, and we want to manage tool settings to filter with in the, if then else and not only with go to because it's sometimes uh, difficult to specify only go to um, uh, go to in a questionnaire uh, we have to deal with loops for example iterate on a set of questions for people older than 18 in a household deal with multi-mode including visualized interview form, condition question label according to the previous answers, condition code list, describe non-response with doesn't know or refusal in a second intention, and use uh, external modules, for example, help, help with auto-completion to code answer in a classification. And, um, Pugs and Eno are open source tools. Uh, here you've got uh, two slides uh, giving details about it, about our GitHub um, our documentation, okay, for Pugs and Eno. And uh, I just want to show you um, that we can also visualize the paper form uh, of our questionnaire. And we have um, not only the web form, uh, we have, we've got on, also the paper form, okay. And uh, we got a document uh, for specification and also the DDI in 3.3 uh, version available uh, thanks to Pugs and Eno. So here it's uh, pa the paper form. So it's the same thing as, as uh, the web form, but uh, for the go-to it's not dynamic, we've got a message. Uh, if you answer no, please go to end of seconds because it is not dynamic. And uh, you've got also the specification. Okay, it's for survey designers or people working on the study, on the survey. Um, so here you've got the same information, but you've got besides um, ID of uh, the question of the variable, you've got the code for yes and no, uh, and you've got um, the condition of the go to, the target, uh, you've got for the control, uh, the condition and the message. So it would be easier perhaps to, 
to check the questionnaire before um, collecting the before uh, making the the, the collect uh, instruments. Thank you. And uh, okay, yes. If you have any questions, I am available to, to answer answer them. And I and I'm not um, only <laughs> the only person. Uh, working on this tool. <laughs> you said, uh, I am very proud of uh, I, what I can do with it. It was not that, it's, uh, I am very proud of what we can do with it. Thank you. And uh, hello to Anne and Francois and Thomas who are um, watching this meeting. Thank you, Fabienne. This uh, was really impressive. Um, <clears throat> and we um, received also another comment from Ida, great tools. And um, so there was a question about the open source. I think you have said this, that the... Yes, um, it is open source. I, I, I said yeah. it very quickly. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I know that... Uh, the slides will be available soon uh, uh, after this uh, this meeting. But yes, it is uh, open source. I can uh, here you've got our GitHub uh, uh, reference. Mm. Yeah, and there's also a hint from Hilde that the tool is also registered at the DDI Alliance webpage, where you have this uh, tools directory, and uh, yes. people can find it there as well. Yes, if they are looking for it. And a former colleague of mine uh, named uh, Guillaume Dufes has, has, um, has done a great, great uh, work with uh, DDI Alliance. Alliance, yeah. Alliance sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another question about how to enter the uh, questions. Uh, can the questionnaires be entered from existing files or only through manual entry? It's only for, for manual entry okay. because we've got um, a model um, uh, behind Pugs. We've got an um, XML model uh, called um, Pugs model, and we've got the DDI L three point three. And so these uh, two models are quite difficult, so it's uh, easier to um, enter everything manually than to try to um, transform it. Or perhaps also we don't have many uh, XSLT um, resources in INSEE, so we mm. prefer to ask people to enter it manually. So maybe you can tell, are you processing a lot of um, previous studies, older studies with this new tool now, or is it only used for, uh, for new questionnaires that you Starting. Uh, we are using it uh, for uh, 13 uh, business uh, st uh, studies and uh, we are um, adding uh, the surveys um, as far as they uh, are going to be collected. So uh, we've got uh, historical surveys which uh, were uh, collected with other tools before and then a new collect uh, of uh, this study uh, um, uh, comes, uh, we are um, adding this to, to our new tools. And we are now um, working on household surveys. So we are working on, uh, on uh, we, we've, we have already three uh, household surveys um, short ones in uh, in these uh, stools, and we are working on a big one uh, on housing. Uh, uh, it will be collected with uh, these new tools in uh, 2023. Okay, that's interesting. And another question from Benjamin. Great tool and presentation. Thank Just you, a question Madonna. regarding reuse of items and pokes. Can you reuse items like questions, code lists, and sequences across questionnaires, or do you create lots of duplicates in your database? Um, at the moment, uh, the link between PUGS and our um, metadata repository um, is not uh, is not working, but we are working on it. Uh, we want to um, publish our questionnaire in uh, our um, repository. 
which uh, is using uh, Collectica, um, Collectica tools. And uh, then uh, we use card list, question, questioners, sometimes uh, entire sequences of a questioner, uh, but it, we have a lot, uh, lot of uh, work um, before, uh, e before the link uh, yeah. is a, 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 a real success. Okay. Uh, I have another question myself. Uh, do you also create uh, questionnaires in, in different languages? Because you've shown the English example and there was some French mixed into it. Uh, no, we... Uh, um, in uh, France, I think we've got... In, in, in INSEE, we've got two uh, surveys uh, with um, several languages uh, or census but uh, it is not uh, using uh, this tool at the moment. And uh, we've got another one uh, about um, trajectory and origin of peoples, but it is not using this tool at the moment. But I think we, um, we will be able to, to manage uh, several, several languages, but it is not uh, working at the moment, yes. Yeah, but you've shown uh, uh, the, at least the paper output seemed to me that if you enter one language, then this language is, is completely uh, on, on the paper questionnaire, yes, yes. right? For the so paper, it's, can be it's done. okay. Yeah. We can see yeah. that uh, here, uh, my user interface, uh, you can see um, English buttons, you know, uh, uh, labels, but uh, I am... Uh, working uh, most of the time with a French version. So yeah. we've, we've got it as the two possibility uh, for the user interface. And for in the web form, it's true that we don't have, sometimes we, we only uh, have a French message, but I think we will be able to have uh, also uh, English message. Hmm. It should be better for demo version like that. <laughs> Yeah, I think people are interested into that. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any further questions at the moment. Um, Alina reminds us all, uh, if we want to keep connected, we can go to the Edit Discord channel. She has pasted the link into the chat uh, if you want to open this. And uh, are there any general questions? So you can now step up we have five minutes left okay thank you doesn't look like this at the moment so i can just remind you that there are two okay uh, we we had a moment when we could not could not hear you, Wolfgang. Ah, okay. Um, are we still connected now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I just wanted to remind people of the afternoon session starting at three uh, Central European time. Uh, two questions about harmonization, uh, um, uh, and the other session is about uh, DDI CDI. So, um, please, everybody also visit those sessions and thank you very much uh, all our presenters we, we